I'll be reading from Psalm 98, four through nine. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and sound of horns, make a joyful noise before the King, the King of the Lord of Lords. Let the sea roar, let all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth, he will judge the world with righteousness and the people with equity. Let us pray. Lord, Father, we, we come, Lord, um, we just thank you that we can come together once again to worship you. We come into your house this morning to sing praises to you for your faithfulness, your goodness. And we thank you, Lord, for creating us and giving us your son, Jesus Christ. Fill us with your spirit, and may we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, let us re be reminded of why we're here today, to worship him because he deserves all the praise and honor. How great is our God. Stand again, and if our God is for us, then you can never stop us. And 
And if our God is with us, then what could stand again? Your praise will ever be on my 
let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much uh, for this awesome Sunday and this privilege to come and worship you and to praise your name in your house today. Lord, Father God, we just pray for so many people traveling right now, including Pastor Derek's family, that you keep them safe and um, you bring them home safely as well. Lord, Father, as we just sang, Father, that you have never failed and that we know that you are in control of our lives in the midst of all the struggles and even the stress that comes with the pandemic and economic downturns or whatever we may be struggling with, Lord. We lift those burdens up to you and present them at your feet, Father, because you, we know that our lives are in your hands and you are in control of everything. Lord, Father, we give a portion of our earnings, our first and the best uh, to you this morning. Uh, we pray that the leaders of the church will be able to have discernment to utilize the funds to further your kingdom, Lord Father God, and spread the gospel in the greater Phoenix area and beyond. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone here this morning, although it seems like more than half the people are probably out, which is indicative of, I'm sure, a lot of viewing online. Uh, so, Mike, you'll, you'll check those numbers, right, to see whether there's more streams today. Um, it is fall break, so I understand a lot of people are traveling. With that said, just a couple housekeeping items. Um, so it's fall break, so we, don't, we can actually leave all this stuff up this Sunday, today, uh, for one week, so mi minimizes our burden today uh, as the school itself is out on fall break. And then for those of you that are wondering where the bathroom uh, are, that's available. Unfortunately, right now, we have to go through this door for the bathroom that's next to the gym, as the one that's behind us is closed. And if you get to the fellowship hall and go outside, there's a bathroom out there that you can also utilize as well. So unfortunately, yeah, there was some mis miscommunication, so apologies for the um, inconvenience this morning. Anyway, glad everyone can join. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, we encourage you to uh, Come to the fellowship hall right after the service. Uh, we do have time of sharing, and there's some food provided today as well, and we'd like to get to know you better. So please join us for food and fellowship at, in the fellowship hall after the service today. Just a couple of announcements. So we're still preparing for the Harvest Festival on October 31st. So if you haven't signed up already, it's another plug. Please do so. Um, you should have received an email with the link uh, to be able to do that. And then our monthly prayer meeting is coming up this Wednesday, as well as a women's picnic on Saturday, October 23rd. One announcement that's not on this uh, slide is, so this is a good thing. Our Lighthouse group, uh, we, our small group, so currently we have four small groups, but the, the small groups are expanding and growing, and so we just want to announce today officially to the church that John and Janice, um, they are multiplying. We never want to say the word split when small groups kind of like divide, right? We don't want those negative words of dividing or splitting, but we're multiplying and giving birth to another small group. So John and Janice will be launching that um, here in the coming days. So we want to, I guess, give them a word of blessing and encouragement and give them a round of a hand just to take that step to lead another small group. And for those of you, you that aren't plugged into a small group yet, we encourage you to do so. Now there'll be officially five groups. There's uh, you know, various locations throughout the greater Phoenix area and based upon your family demographics, uh, age or, or, or location, please we encourage you to drop in and try different small groups out and see which one may uh, best suit you and your family. Okay, I know Pastor Derek's out, but we are blessed today to have Pastor Josh deliver the message for us, and so let me turn it over to him. Thank you, Pastor Josh. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, Journey of Faith. How are we doing this morning? <laughs> Pretty good. It is exciting to hear that there are small groups that are multiplying out there. You know, Sunday morning is, 
is good. It's where you get fed with the Word of God. But um, the small groups is where the rubber meets the road. It's where God's Word meets real life with real people and real relationships. So, again, I want to I want to reiterate: if you are not involved in a small group, I do encourage you to to join a small group. So it's it's good to hear that we're multiplying in that regard, and and the Lord is blessing in that way. Um, well, I want to start off with with this idea that everything. That's ever been designed, think about it, everything that's ever been designed or created is done so for a purpose, right? Is done so for a purpose. And I was thinking about this because we are created in God's image, we are also designed for a purpose. And what purpose is that, right? What purpose is that? Well, we're designed to worship. I remember. Um, I used to babysit this kid when I was uh, when I was younger, and I used to babysit this kid, and I used to love it all the time because we I would go over to his house, and as I'm babysitting him, we would play Legos, right? I'm gonna take this off. We would play Legos together, and I I, I still love Legos, right? <laughs> and I remember this 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 young boy that I would I would babysit, um, so creative, you know, he would create he would he would build these little tanks or little air, aircraft things, and I would ask him, I said, what are you building? You know, and he's like, I'm an aircraft, I'm like, what, is it, what does it do? And he would tell me all the little things about, okay, so this part does this, and this thing does this. So it's, he, everything that he put on that Lego, built together, it's almost like he had a, you know, this is what it does. He was explaining how it does, and I have this, I have this image in my head that that's kind of how creation was, right? Like God takes this pile of dirt and starts creating man, and all the angels are kind of gathering around and saying, you know, what are you making? And, and, you know, God says, I call it man, right? And the angels are like, well, what does it do? <laughs> what does it do? Well, it does, it does a lot of things, right? But one thing it does is it worships, right? And it worships me. Everything that's ever designed and ever created was created for a purpose. We are created to worship. You know, and I, I, it's, I, what I want to do is kind of remind ourselves of the basics, kind of strengthen our foundation. You know, John Piper said, you know, the ultimate purpose of the church really is worship. I like what he says. He says, missions exists. Why? Because worship doesn't. Right? Missions exist because worship doesn't. The premise being, right, the, there are places out there that don't know Christ, that don't know God. Right? And so how can you worship what you don't know? And so the idea of missions is to go out and tell people about this good news so that they can worship God. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning, this idea of worship. I don't have a clicker, so I guess I'll just have to, <laughs> yeah, just go ahead, next slide. What is worship, right? I found a lot of interesting definitions. You go to, you know, the, the Merriam-Webster, and um, I think every believer, right, every believer recognizes that, huh? Oh, sorry. I, I think every believer recognizes that it's more than just it's more than just singing, right? When we talk about worship, hopefully we're thinking more than just the Sunday worship service. We're just we're thinking more than just singing in church. I remember in my old church at the Chinese church, there was a young lady that heard about our church from one of our members, and they found out we didn't have a, a, a pianist for 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 leading worship. And she decided, you know, she came to our church and, and offered. She's like, you know, I, 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 actually, I actually graduated with a major in, in piano, you know, so I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm wondering if I could play for you. And we actually, we, I, I mean, she was really good, but we had to refuse because she was not a believer. She didn't, she didn't really understand that our, our time for singing was not a performance, was not just something that we do to, you know, just kind of for the sake of doing. It's spiritual worship. And so what is worship? Worship is a genuine expression of our soul to God. It's, a, it's an expression in his, to his presence. It's an expression of our souls to his power. And a person, I, I submit that a person cannot worship God if he first does not have a personal relationship with God. Right? How can we worship what we don't know? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and we will be in verses 22 to 24. Again, if you don't have your Bibles, I have the, the verses on the screen. But I do encourage you to, to, to open up your Bibles because um, there's just, I don't know, there's something about having a, 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 a real Bible in front of you. But um, again, if you don't have it, the words are on the screen. John chapter 4, verses 22 to 20 feet, 24. I'll go ahead and read it. You can read along with me. It says this You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, 
when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So what's going on in this passage? Jesus is, is this, this is actually Jesus speaking, and he's talking, she, he's talking to a Samaritan woman that he met, she, he met at the well, right? And she's talking about all the, the, the different husbands that she's had, right? All the four husbands that she had that kind of passed away, and, and she's talking, he's talking to her about this. And she says that there are people in this place that have been worshiping on this mountain for, for a very, very long time. And Jesus says to her, there will come a time when true worshipers will worship God. What is he talking about there? What does he mean by worshiping? What does he mean, what is he talking about? A tr- what does he mean by true worshipers? And so I want to look at, I want to look actually at David. So we're going to be studying David and we're looking at the Psalm 100. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 100. We're going to flip back to the Old Testament and we're going to look at this passage, you know, because David was a man after God's own heart. A lot of the Psalms were actually written by David. Right? And we know that psalms are, are Hebrew poetry. Right? They were an expression of David's heart, David's soul to God. Right? And that's why it's included in Scripture. And so if you, ha- if you will, turn with me to Psalm chapter 100. And we'll, we'll go ahead and read that. It says, we'll read the whole passage since it's not that long. It says this, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. And I pray now that uh, as we open up your word and study it, Lord, that you would speak to us, Lord. I pray that as we, we, we come together this morning to talk about what does it mean to be a true worshiper? What does it mean to worship you? Um, I pray that you would, uh, you would speak to us. I pray that you would empty me of myself and any arrogance or any nervousness or whatever, Lord, that, uh, that, that is in me. I pray that you would just use me as your vessel to speak your truth. I pray that you would make us um, open and aware this morning. I pray that you help us keep the distractions at bay, Lord, and, and just focus on, on what you would have us to learn, Lord. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, from this passage, there are a number of things that a, a true worship that true worship does, right? When we're actually worshiping, it, it, it does something. So let's look at a few of them, right? First, okay, true worship responds to God's presence. What is true worship? True worship responds to God's presence. What, it, what does our passage say? Go back to our pa- go, go continue on. Yeah, it says there, right? It says when we worship, we should what? The verse says we should come before Him. With joyful noise. What we're doing is we're standing in God's presence. Like imagine yourself in the throne room of God. Because that's exactly what we do when we come in the presence of God to worship him. I think so often it's as if we're worshiping before an empty throne. As if like God's away. Sometimes we just kind of sing for the sake of singing. We could, I mean, we know that when we start Sunday, when Sunday starts, it's going to start with worship. So we're going to be singing. And so I think for a lot of us, since we're still not in the mode of imagining ourselves in God's throne room, we're just singing for the sake of singing. Our response is really to the music and to the performers and not to God's presence, not to God's truth. And so we have to remember that there is a keen awareness of, of God's presence. Where, where people are gathered, that's where God will be. We must worship in spirit. John chapter, uh, John chapter 4, verse 24 says, we must worship in spirit. You see, our spirit connects with the Holy Spirit that is indwelled within us. And it is that which, ca- that, that's the thing that moves us. Let me ask you, when was the last time you were moved like during a worship, during a worship session, like during a time of worship. Like when was the last time singing a song or, or praising the Lord brought you to your knees in, in tears? Like you're, maybe some of you are like, well, that's kind of never happened to me. 
You know, when was the last time the Spirit, Holy Spirit moved you? When was the last time the Holy Spirit made your heart sensitive to the truths that you were singing? You see, just as God is meant to be known, God is also meant to be experienced. And so only having that head knowledge without worshiping in spirit makes our worship, it makes it dry. It makes it impersonal. You know, we know what Jesus did for us on the cross. We know what Jesus did for mankind on the cross. Right? For, for God, I mean that famous verse, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. But when we remember that it is us that he died for. For God so loved me. Why we, 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 we respond differently because it's personal. That he gave his only begotten son. And it's similar to, to the difference between, you know, reading about, you know, reading about the Grand Canyon and actually going and visiting it, right? Going, and see, going in the midst of, of God's creation and seeing the Grand Canyon all around you. That, that's the difference when, when, our, when we worship without the spirit. Right? When we're just singing for the sake of singing, it's like we're, we're reading, about, we're, we know all this head knowledge about Christ, about God, and we're singing it, but it's just all in our heads. That's the same as, like, that's, just, that's like reading about the Grand Canyon. But then when, you, when we, true worship is about coming into God's presence. Right? It's about actually being there and experiencing God, seeing the Holy, well, feeling the Holy Spirit work as we're meditating on his truth. You see, one aspect of church growth, if we're, expect, if we're going to expect this church to grow, is healthy worship, right? The sign of a healthy church is a healthy worship. When all its worshipers are not just singing at the same time with good voices, it doesn't even matter if your voices are good or not. It's about whether our hearts are singing to God. I was reading an article, and they were doing a, a study on revivals, right? And how, how revivals work and how revivals spread, you know, and they were, at, they were trying to answer the question, what makes a revival spread? And they came to the conclusion that it, it, a lot of the vis- it's, it's a lot of the visitors experiencing the presence of God. To know that he is real. To know that God's presence is real to us and that we can feel him when we worship. I remember the first time I went to a Bible study at Campus Crusade for Christ. This was when I was in college. And during this time, I still had not been a believer. I had not been saved. You know, so I, I didn't really grow up in the church. So I, I knew that people in church sang, right, sang to God. That's kind of what they did. But I was invited by a friend, and, you know, I, I sat in on this, on this worship service. And I just remember the atmosphere was so different from just a normal kind of church service. I remember observing the way people were singing. It, it, was, it, was, it was genuine. Like they, they didn't even care. Like, like there, was, there were people just singing their heart out. They didn't even care who was listening because they weren't singing to each other. They were singing to God. They were all singing to God. Right now, that alone, like observing that experience alone was, you know, was not enough to convict me and bring me to salvation. But it did let me know that there was something that, that they were experiencing that I wasn't. They, I, was miss, I was missing out on something that was genuine and that was real. And honestly, that was the first, that was, that was the trigger that kind of started me on this journey of like, okay, well, can God be experienced? Is God real? How, how is God real in my life? You see, true worship um, responds to the presence of God. But ne- nextly, go ahead, next slide. True worship acknowledges who God is. True worship not, not only responds to his presence, but it acknowledges who God is. We go back to our, our, our Psalm 100. Look at verse 3. What does it say? Okay. It says, no, right? Know that the Lord is good. The psalm says to know that the Lord is God. And if you see that word Lord, right, the Lord is in all capitals because it's talking about God's personal name, Yahweh, right? In other words, if you look at John, John chapter 4, verse 24, it says we must worship not only in spirit, but what? In truth. And the, what does that mean? It means theology matters, I mean, that, that, when it comes down to it, that, that's what it matters. Thought, theology matters. It's not just the attitude that we have when we're worshiping. It's also the content. And so we should be worshiping the God who is, not who we want him to be or who we think he is. 
Right, next slide, right? In, in the Hebrew, there's two different words for know, right, to know. There's yeda and there's yada, right? Yeda is one of this, like, intellectual knowledge. It's, it's that head knowledge, right? And yada is just more, is this more of an experiential knowledge. And, and the, the word that David is using here is, next slide, yada, right? This is the verb that, that David is using in his psalm. He's saying, know experientially that Yahweh is God. Yahweh is sovereign. Right? We know that God is good. We know that. We read that. We're taught that. We tell each other that. But here's a question. Have you experienced his goodness? We know that God is loving and God is merciful. But have you experienced his love? Have you experienced his mercy? You see, when we worship in spirit, but not in truth, right? If we, worship in, if we worship in spirit, but not in truth, our worship becomes shallow and superficial. If we worship only in truth, but not in spirit, our, our worship is dry. It's, super, it's, 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 it's disingenuous because we're not responding to the presence of God. It's just we're just singing for the sake of singing. And in the same way, okay, if we worship only in spirit, but we don't worship in truth, our worship is, is shallow, it's superficial. If all we want when we're worshiping is to evoke some kind of emotion, right? And if that's, what, if that's what we're trying to do is just kind of provoke a certain emotion, you know, in the atmosphere, then the emotion is the result of manipulation. Think about that. The, the emotion that we feel in our worship is a result of manipulation, not contemplation or conviction. That's what happens when we don't worship in truth. Right? The words of the songs that we sing to God should be grounded in Scripture, and it should cause us to meditate on Him in truth. You know, I, I, I have heard songs. You know, I mean, they're good songs, but they, they, they make me stop and go, wait, is that, is that, is that actually in the Bible? I've heard, I've read some lyrics and, and of certain songs, and I say, wait, what is that, what is that even, have you ever, you ever ask yourself that? You're actually like reading what you're singing, and you're, you're thinking, what does that even mean? What does that, what does that actually look like? Right? And again, it's not just this, it's not, I'm not just talking about Sunday singing worship, right? We're not just talking about in the context of Sunday worship, but it, worship it goes everywhere, extends even to our service. I remember in our old church, we used to take our youth down to, to Mexico to do short-term missions. And, uh, I mean, it was, a, it was an incredible, amazing opportunity. We would go down there, and we would, uh, we would do VBS for the kids. You know, we would put on a skit and a play about the gospel, and we would, we would, we would do VBS and hold, and then we would we'd help feed, the, feed some of the poor. So it was, it was an amazing experience. And for many people, though, especially the young people, a lot of times they were just kind of riding this spiritual high, right? This, it was kind of, for, for most of them, a lot of them, it was just this kind of emotional experience. I mean, they, if you think about it, it makes sense because when you're on that missions trip, usually we would do it during spring break or fall break. So we would have a whole week. So that whole week was just dedicated to going on this missions trip. And in that whole week, right, the youth are so focused. They're so dedicated because everything is saturated. They're, they learn how to walk every single moment moment in faith. And in doing that, they see God's handiwork. They see God answering prayer. Right? And so they come back on fire for the Lord. But that, so many, so often, that is where I see the danger comes in. Right? The danger comes not during the trip, but what happens when the, when the youth come back. I remember... I was talking to one of my youth, and you know he he had gone to Mexico for a couple times with a couple times with us, and this was going to be his third time going. And you know I, I was trying to encourage him to go, and and he told me straight up, he said, Pastor Josh, I don't think I'm going to go on this trip, you know this 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 time. I'm like, okay, so is that because you know you got something else going on or you know, something else? <laughs> and he said, well. No, I just, I just don't want to go. And so I knew there was something else going on. So I said, well, okay, let's sit down. Let's have a real chat here. Like, why? What's, what's going on? Why do you really not want to go? And he said, he thought about it. He said, you know what, Pastor Josh, the reason I don't want to go is because 
I'm afraid to come back. I'm afraid to come back and, and, and feel that like disappointment of becoming lukewarm, of you know, things kind of going back to normal, of losing that, that fire, right? And that's what happens to a lot of people when they go on, on short-term mission trips, especially if you've gone for the first time. Everything is a new experience. Everything is novel. Everything is interesting. And so you're taking it all in, right? And so when they come back, it's like you see them on fire for the Lord. You see what they, I mean, a lot of the parents would come up to me and say, what, what happened in Mexico? Our kids are on fire for the Lord. Our kids are just like, they're, they're, they have a desire to go to church now. They're, they're praying, Right? And then you follow up with them a couple weeks later, and it seems like everything is just kind of back to normal. And I, told, I, I thought about it, and I, I told this young man, I said, you know, the purpose of the trip is for missions, right? It's, it's to serve others in obedience to God. And I told him, don't use those trips to remember how you feel. Because, yes, those trips may give you some amazing experiences, but don't focus on how you felt in those trips or how those trips made you feel. The purpose of those trips is to remember who God is and what God did in that trip through you. Right? When we're worshiping, and it's the same with our worship. Right? When, when we don't worship in truth, our worship just becomes kind of superficial. All we're doing is writing a, an emotion. But what our worship also does, it also, it's also a recognition of who we are in light of him. Let's look at the next, next slide. Okay. <clears throat> our worship is a recognition of who we are in light of him. When you understand who the true God is, when you stand in his presence, you understand how insignificant and sinful you are. Right, next slide. That, that's the difference, right? That's the difference between what we call false modesty, right, which is a pretending to have a low opinion of yourself, and true humility, right? False, false, false modesty says, you know, well, you know, I, oh, I'm such a sinner, and, you know, like, wow. But true humility says, like, as David says, I, I'm a worm. Paul says, I'm a worm. I, I, I'm not worthy of you. Right? I mean, he's, if you go back, go back, actually go back. Right? What does the psalmist say? What does David say? It is he who made us. This is, a, this is David acknowledging who we are in light of God. It is he who made us, and we are his. He's, he's understanding his own insignificance, his own sinfulness, as he stands in the presence of God. And when you stand before the, before the presence of God, there is humility there. God humbles us. Because he brings to light the truth about who we are. Right? Next slide. But at the same time, it's crazy because at the same time, in the same way, you also understand that at the same time that you're insignificant and sinful, you are also significant and precious to God. And that's the difference between what we call flattery, right? Which is being excessive and insincere in your praise, in your admiration. Okay? And genuine praise is the difference between saying, you know, just, just saying out loud, God is awesome. Right? And saying from your heart, no, like God, like we are his people. We are his people. And that's, I mean, it's, it's so interesting because when you stand before that presence, you realize that you're insignificant, but to God, you are significant. It's, it's, a, it's a weird mystery that I, I encourage you and challenge you to reflect on. And one of the, one of the things I, I often pray, I, I often find myself praying this, and I challenge you to pray this too. I, I so often say, Lord, show me how big you are today. Right? Show me how big you are today. Show, like, sh show me the, the magnitude of your grace, of your love, of your power, of your provision. I, I remember... When I was a baby, you know, as I was, uh, as I was, um, I remember one time in church, the preacher was preaching, and I, I just, he said something, and I just kind of went off on a rabbit trail. I started thinking about one little thing that he said, and I, 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 I was thinking about just how much God loves me. Right? I, I was really just meditating on that one simple, so obvious thought, 
right? Like God loves me. And it just, the, the, the realization of that truth just like fell over me. And I, I, I started like, you know, welling at the eyes. I started, and, and I started getting excited. And it was crazy because afterwards when everybody, after the service was over, I, I, I ran up to my friends, my church friends, and I said, guys, guess what? Like I just, I just realized something so amazing, you know? And they said, what is it? God loves me. And they, you know, they gave me this funny look like, well, yeah, right? Like, God loves all of us, right? But I'm like, no, you don't get it. You, like, I get it now. Like, I, 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 I see how, like, I see that. I've experienced that, right? Never let the truth, guys, never let the truth of how much God loves you get to your head. Don't let it simply become a statement or a fact. It's more than that. It's a testimony. It's a promise. And people who are true, true worshipers, okay, they recognize who we are in light of him. They respond to his presence, and they acknowledge who God is. They also acknowledge who we are in light of him. Right? Next, lastly, oh, previous one, right? Lastly, true worship responds genuinely with joy and humility. True worship responds genuinely with joy and humility. Going back to our Psalm 100, you know, I kind of highlighted there all the verbs, right? All the, all the verbs. Shout for joy. Worship with gladness. Come. Know. Enter. Give thanks. All these verbs that Paul, or that Paul, that David uses in this poem to God are imperatives, right? They're commands. Do this. Shout. But when you know the presence of God, when you're in the presence of God, when you're worshiping him in spirit and in truth, they're not really commands, right? God's not saying, you need to do this. This is obey, right? Shout, do that now. <laughs> Worship, do that now. It's not a command. It's more like a natural, obvious response, Right? The natural, obvious response when we stand before God is to give him praise. I mean, even Paul says that. He, what does he say? He says, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? Because they will be in the presence of Christ. They will see his majesty. They will see his glory. And the natural response to that, whether you are sinful or whether you are saved, is to fall down on your knees. And to worship him and to acknowledge him as he is, Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, when you, when, we, when you worship, like real worship, when you truly worship, it, it's natural to do it with gladness. I mean, like, how can you, I mean, think about it. Can you worship with a, with a, with a, with a, with a, like a, a heart that's not right with the Lord? Can you worship when, when your mind is clouded with other things? Not really. I mean, you can, you can sing, but can you really worship, right? Can you, when you worship, it's, a, it's, a natural, it's natural to do it with gladness. When you come before him, it's natural to do it singing songs of joy. What does it say? It says, go back, yeah, there. It says, um, come before him with joyful songs. When you enter his gates, it's natural. The natural response is to do it with thanksgiving. You see, any person... Any person who is truly confronted with the goodness and the greatness of God and doesn't respond with humility or awe or joy is either, I mean, is either physically dead or spiritually dead, right? I mean, you read the Old Testament of people, you read the Old Testament accounts and the New Testament accounts of people who have come into the presence of God, Right? There's not one that falls down in fear, in awe, in joy. And the ones that don't, they're, I mean, they're destroyed by, they're literally destroyed by God's presence, by God's glory. You know, one of the things I love doing, I actually really like hanging out with new believers. Any of you kind of, kind of feel the same way? I, you know why I like hanging out with new believers? Because they have this, they have this, this fire in them. They have this joy that seems to just kind of, it just radiates out because all of a sudden they, they know now. They are, they, are, they are convinced because of God's promise. They believe. And, and they're, they're, just, they're just joyful. 
and you see them, they have this, once they have this new relation, newfound relationship with Christ, it's like they have this ravenous, like, thirst and this curiosity for the things of God. Right? They start attending small group. They start attending church. They, 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 get, they get involved in Bible studies. So they start reading. They start asking questions. They start talking to the pastors. They, start, they, they, they want this information because they have this amazing relationship that they that they've have with God now. And I, I love being around that because that kind of rubs off. You know, it's like I, I remember when I first became a, a believer, right? And I, I felt kind of the same way. Of course, we, like we said, it's not about that feeling. But I just love, I love their attitude. I remember I visited, I think I, I, I actually told this story before in a, in a previous message. But it's so relevant even here today. I remember visiting a church in Singapore, right? And there was a girl who got saved, Right? And she wanted to do a solo. She wanted to sing a solo for the church. And, uh, it, you know, like as she was singing, she got up and she was telling her testimony and it was amazing. And we were just like, whoa. And she's like, so, you know, I just want to sing out to God. And so she did. And as she started singing, I mean, it was not good. Right? It was not very good. I mean, she, her pitch was very off. She had the wrong kind of tempo. She was, and she wasn't really playing along with the music. And, and it was just, it was so bad. And, you know, like I, I just, I remember... I remember praying to the Lord. I said, Lord, make her voice better. Like, Lord, just, just help her to stop embarrassing herself. Like, this is, this is kind of bad. I feel like I could feel like the church just kind of getting like that awkward un uneasiness. You know what I'm talking about? Like, and that's when God rebuked me. You know, he said, what are you, what are you talking about? Look at her face. She's singing to me. She's not singing to you. She's singing to me. You're hearing her voice, but I'm hearing her heart. And it's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. Because it's, it, was not, it was not singing. It was worship. And it was not just, you know, out of an obligation or a duty. It was, it was out of joy. It was a, a genuine expression of her soul to God. Next slide. You see, true worship... True worship comes when we experience and we respond to God's presence. True worship comes when we understand and acknowledge who he is. And it's the result of genuine joy and humility. Going back to our passage that we started in the beginning, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, he said, these are the kinds of worshipers that the Lord is seeking. Not just people who will sing songs about me, but who will sing truth to me and, and, and meditate on that truth. Right? And now I talked, again, I talked mostly in the context of, you know, worshiping in church on Sunday, but what about outside Sunday? What about outside the Sunday morning service? You know, where and when do you worship? Right? Is it possible to, is it po do we only confine our worship to one hour of one day of one week? Or do we worship God throughout our day, throughout our week, at work, or at home, or when we're alone? Again, when was the last time you were in awe of God's power? Like you saw God's power working and you're just like, whoa. When was the last time you were surprised by God's goodness? When was the last time that you were like emotionally overwhelmed by God's love? When was the last time... You got goosebumps thinking about God's righteousness and his wrath, even. You see, maybe, maybe our worship life is lifeless. Maybe our worship life is just kind of indifferent or, or disingenuous. I think maybe we ought to start asking the Lord, like, like just to pray that simple prayer. Lord, show us, show us how big you are. Remind us that your very presence is here with us today, even this morning. Maybe it's time that we ought to ask God, like, God, help us in our unbelief. Take the veil off our eyes so that we may see and we may worship genuinely. Right? I, I love, John, as John was worshiping here in this morning before I came up, he said something in passing, but that, I want to focus on that. 
Right? The God who created all things, the God who judges all things, the God who reconciles enemies and sinners to himself, the God who is faithful and good and just and merciful, that God, my God, our God, that God is worthy of all our worship. And so John posed this question. I want to pose this question to you. If God is worthy of our worship... Is our worship worthy of God? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. And I know that as I was preparing this message, Lord, I was even convicted about my own worship life, Lord. About how sometimes my worship life is dry. How sometimes my worship life is just is shallow. How everything that I know is just head knowledge, Lord. But I pray that that would not be so. And I pray that that would not be so individually as for us as believers and for us collectively as a church, Lord. I pray that you would remind us that worship first is not, is not about our lips. It's not about the music and the instruments. It's about our hearts focused on you, meditating on you, delighting in you, praising, in, praising you. I pray that when we shout, we shout for joy, that that, jo that shout would be genuine. I pray that when we, when we know you, we would know you with an experiential knowledge, not just head knowledge, Lord. And I pray that we wouldn't just w limit our worship to one hour of one day of one week, Lord. But I pray that you would teach us how to open our eyes so that we can worship you throughout the day, throughout the week. So that as we see your power working in us, as we see your goodness upon us, as we see your mercy blanket us, Lord, that our natural response would be joy, our natural response would be humility, our natural response would be praise. And I pray that for us. I pray that you would help us examine ourselves, our, our own lives, and whether or not our, worth, our worship is worthy of you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Let us respond with this last song. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with the song. Oh,
perfect love You rescued me so I could stand and see I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your love for us. And, uh, and I just pray now that as we go out, that you would be with us, Lord, that we would worship continually, Lord, and we would, we would, we would, our worship would be worthy of you, Lord. I pray that we would worship, as it says in Scripture, in spirit and in truth, Lord, that we would see your handiwork and we would respond naturally with worship, naturally with awe, Lord. And I pray that for us this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.